Now it's time for the last word, but it's Ali Velshi. That's in for Lawrence O'Donnell. Allie, we've done this earlier this it's, week. Well, look at this, oh, is I, like, I, this is becoming a habit between the two of us. Look at you, legal expert extraordinaire, taking a little walk into my economic sandbox there. I was like, I'm trying to get ready for the show. It's like, what are you talking about? The price fixing, economics, Federal Trade Commission, antitrust. That's my that's my jam. That was great. Well, you you are certainly a role model for all of us, and you wear many hats. And well, so I just wanted to put on my Ali Velshi hat this evening. It was fantastic. You did it better than Ali Velshi would have. I thought that was a great conversation, uh, and I think Faz's point is really valid. That, and you know this as a lawyer. Governments do this. Governments are there to ensure yeah. that consumers are protected, not just financially, but in terms of in terms of uh, over concentration in any industry. Like that's just normal. Every government in the world that is functioning will do that. There's nothing communist or socialist about that. That's consumer protection. It's basic stuff. Well, you know what? It's always so good to see you. Not on the weekend. During the week, you, also, are, and, and you I, are the hardest working man in TV. We'll That's still cross over say. on the weekend like we normally do. Great to see you, my friend. Thank you, Katie. Good to see you. Well, we got breaking news tonight. We just saw Vice President Kamala Harris in her first joint interview with her running mate, Tim Walls. And if Donald Trump thinks he's going to have an easy time in a debate about the economy with Vice President Harris, you might want to listen to this and think again. You have been vice president for three and a half years. Yeah. The steps that you're talking about now why haven't you done them already? Well, first of all, we had to recover as an economy, and we have done that. And I'm very proud of the work that we have done that has brought inflation down to less than 3%. The work that we have done to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for seniors. Donald Trump said he was going to do a number of things, including allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Never happened. We did it. So now, in I, as I travel in the state of Georgia and around our country, the number of seniors that have benefited, I've met, I was in Nevada recently, a, a, a grandmother who showed me her receipts. And before we capped the cost of insulin for seniors at $35 a month, she was paying hundreds of dollars, up to thousands of dollars a month for her insulin. She's not doing that so anymore. you maintain binomics is a success. I maintain that when we do the work of bringing down prescription medication for the American people, including capping the cost of the annual cost of prescription medication for seniors at $2,000, when we do what we did in the first year of being in office to extend the child tax credit so that we cut child poverty in America by over 50 percent, when we do what we have done to invest in the American people and bringing manufacturing back to the United States so that we created over 800,000 new manufacturing jobs, bringing business back to America, what we have done to improve the supply chain so we're not relying on foreign governments to supply American families with their basic needs, I'll say that that's good work. There's more to do, but that's good work. Here's Vice President uh, Harris on another topic that Donald Trump feels is good for him, the border through bipartisan work, including some of the most conservative members of the United States Congress, a bill was crafted, which we supported, which I support. And Donald Trump got word of this bill that would have contributed to securing our border. And because he believes that it would not have helped him politically, he told his folks in Congress, don't put it forward. He killed the bill a border security bill that would have put 1,500 more agents on the border. And let me tell you something, the Border Patrol endorsed the bill. And I'm, sure, and I'm sure in large part because they knew they were working around the clock and 1,500 more agents would help them. That bill would have allowed us to increase seizures of fentanyl. Ask any community in America that has been devastated by fentanyl what passing that bill would have done to address their concern and a pain that they've so you experienced. Would, so you would push that legislation again. I just want Not to ask about... push it. I will make sure that it comes to my desk and I would sign it. We have laws that have to be followed and enforced that address and deal with people who cross our border illegally and there should be consequences. And let's be clear, in this race, I'm the only person who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations who traffic in guns, drugs, and human beings. I'm the only person in this race who actually served a border state as attorney general to enforce our laws. And I would enforce our laws as president going forward. I recognize the problem. And here's what Governor Walsh said tonight about his family. 
grateful for so many reasons to be on this ticket, but that moment, um, to understand what was really important, to, to have my son uh, feel a sense of pride in me, that I was trying to do the right thing. And uh, it was, um, you know, you try and protect your kids, you know, it brings, it brings notoriety and things, but it was just such a, uh, a visceral, emotional moment that I'm, I'm just, I'm grateful I got to experience it, and I'm, uh, I'm so proud of him. I'm proud of him, I'm proud of Hope, I'm proud of Gwen. She's a wonderful mother, and these are great kids. And Vice President Harris and Governor Wall sat down for their joint interview in Georgia, where the Democratic candidates just wrapped up their two-day bus tour of the state, ending with a huge rally in Savannah. Earlier today, Vice President Harris announced plans to unveil a tax credit proposal for startups at Dottie's Market, a black-owned business in Savannah. This is one of my singular priorities, is to invest and grow our small businesses. So what I'm going to be rolling out next week is basically a tax credit for startups, for small businesses. We're starting out. Yes. Half of America's working population either owns runs or works in a small business. I mean, when we think about strengthening the economy as a whole, not to mention really investing in like the ambition and the dreams. Yes. I mean, that's all of that is what you guys yes. are doing. And creating dreams in the process, Absolutely. right? On the Republican side of the ticket, J.D. Vance made the mistake today of following Tim Walz's speech at the International Association of Firefighters Convention. Tim Walz received a standing ovation from the members of the Firefighters Union yesterday. J.D. Vance? Not so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Well, Semper Fi, guys. We got some, it sounds like we got some fans and some haters. That's okay. President Trump and I are proud to be the most pro-worker Republican ticket in history. And I want to talk about why we're fighting for working people, why we're going to fight for unions and non-union alike. Today, Donald Trump was on the campaign trail in Michigan and Wisconsin, according to new polls that are released tonight. In Michigan, Kamala Harris leads Donald Trump 49 percent to 46 percent. In Wisconsin, Kamala Harris leads Donald Trump 52 percent to 44 percent. In Michigan, Donald Trump defended breaking the law at Arlington National Cemetery by using the hallowed site for a campaign photo op. I go there, they ask me to have a picture, and they say I was campaigning. I don't need... The one thing I get is plenty of publicity. I don't need that. Donald Trump is no stranger to disgraceful conduct. He called American service members who died in war suckers and losers. We're going to discuss what happened at Arlington later in this hour. But a new poll in Georgia tonight shows Kamala Harris leading Donald Trump in Georgia 49 percent to 47 percent. And because you cannot just cover the public campaign of the candidate who tried to overturn the election last time, the speeches, the TV ads, we're going to look at what Republicans are doing in the key states, including in Georgia. The voter suppression, the disenfranchisement, the election chicanery. Today in Georgia, Vice President Harris reminded voters that she is running as the underdog against Donald Trump. We're here to speak truth. And one of the things that we know, this is going to be a tight race until the very end. Okay? So let's not pay too much attention to the polls because we are running as the underdog. Okay. And we have some hard work ahead of us, but we like hard work. Hard work is good work. Hard work is good work. And with your help, we are going to win this November. is always worth fighting for. Always. And that is the fight we are in right now, a fight for America's future. We, we fight for a future with affordable child care, paid leave, and affordable health care. Subject, let's finally expand Medicaid in Georgia so people can take their child to a doctor or go to an emergency room without going into medical debt. We, we fight 
for a future where we build what I call an opportunity economy so that every American has the opportunity to own a home, to start a business, and to build wealth and intergenerational wealth. And a future where we lower the cost of living for America's families. Georgia, for the past two election cycles, voters in this very state, you who are here, have delivered. You sent two extraordinary senators to Washington, D.C. You sent President Biden and me to the White House. You showed up. You knocked on doors. You registered folks to vote. And you made it happen. You did that. You did that. And so now we are asking you to do it again. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Joining us now is the Minnesota Attorney General, Keith Ellison, who knows Kamala Harris well. He knows Tim Walls well. You've actually worked on and off with him, Attorney General, for 18 years. Your offices are right across the hall from uh, one another. So welcome to the show and good to see you again, sir. Good to see you and uh, thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. Uh, let's talk about some of the things that came out in the interview today, uh, particularly when when uh, when Kamala Harris was asked about the border, uh, something that Donald Trump thinks is an Achilles heel for her. And she talked about the fact that of the two people running, uh, she's the only one who has prosecuted people. She's prosecuted uh, uh, people, trans uh, border, uh, you know, g gangs and people who've involved themselves in drug trafficking and human trafficking. She's got a strong argument that she's actually a prosecutor and he's actually a felon. Well, there's no doubt about that. Uh his 34 convictions make it clear as to which side of the law he stands on. He's more or less a one-man crime wave. I mean, he's been found liable for raping a woman. Uh, he's found uh, guilty of uh, defrauding uh, and uh, people. He's, I mean, he's really been quite extraordinary in his own negative exploits. On the other hand, uh, not only has she prosecuted uh, transnational criminals, not only has she held people accountable for human trafficking and things like that, she's also been active on the civil front. Uh, so while she, while he is over here having his his college, Trump University, being shut down because of it's a fraud, she's going after fraudulent charities in California uh, during her entire ten tenure. She's done a real job at law enforcement, and it makes a big difference. I'll also say this. I'm so glad she pointed out that he's the one that killed the bipartisan mm -hmm. compromise bill to try to secure the border. He's the one who did it. It could have been in place. He's the one who stopped it. Because for him, it's really just a political um, uh, tool. It's not really something he's passionate about or committed to. Because if he was, he would have done uh, what you know his Republican senators were uh, bargained for and worked out with their Democratic allies. But, uh, you know, he had other plans. Of course, when you were talking about uh, Donald Trump's civil convictions, you're talking about that uh, civil conviction in, in uh, civil liability in New York where he was found guilty of sexual abuse. Let, let's talk a little bit more about this point you just made with, with the, the border bill. There were a lot of Democrats, including some, <clears throat> some progressives, who thought that bill was too tough. That was a compromised piece of legislation that was done right. with, with, with Republicans. It was bipartisan, which is the way you've got to pass things in, in the House. It was done. It was hard fought. And not everybody liked it, because that's the nature of these kinds of bills. Donald Trump killed it, and he killed it because he, would, he doesn't want this problem solved. He wants to run on border problems, not run on border solutions. He wants to use it. And so here's the thing. You know, I spent 12 years in Congress. Tim Walls was there. Kamala Harris was there. And the real sad moment is that when people reject compromise and feel that if something isn't 100 percent their way, they're against it. You know, but but Democrats and Republicans came together. Everybody didn't like something about it, but everybody liked some things about it. And that was enough to get a bill 
that we could pass. He just said, don't do it because it's not going to help me. Now, what kind of leader puts himself in front of the national interest? What kind of leader says it's all about how it's going to help me and affect me in an election? I mean, it's a character question at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, uh, I was proud to see both Kamala Harris and Tim Walz step right into Dana Bash's very, you know, pointed questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they didn't shy away from controversy. They answered they answered the questions put to them, and they had good answers, and I was glad to see that. She has a good record. To, she has a record to defend and advance on the issue of immigration and other issues as well, and I'm glad she wasn't shy about answering those questions forthrightly. You point out that you you knew her um, and and you and, and like you, uh, she's with an attorney general. She's a prosecutor. What's that? Right. How does that bode for the, the the debates debate or debates coming up? Donald Trump doesn't like her. She gets under his skin. She doesn't seem to get irritated by him. She demurred when asked a question uh, about Donald Trump and his comments about her. She just doesn't let it get to her. Uh, but she is a prosecutor. She knows how to debate. She knows how to argue. How's that going to go? Yeah, let me say something people might not expect. Don't underestimate Donald Trump. He's untethered to the truth. <laughs> he literally will say anything. And so you got she's got to be ready that you don't know what in the world might come out of his mouth. He might claim credit for things he didn't do, deny things he clearly did do. And when you debate somebody like that, it, it is a bit of a challenge. I know she's up to it, but I don't want people to be so uh, uh, expectant that she's just going to clobber him because he's hard to pin down because he doesn't care about the truth. Yeah. So I would I would keep that in mind as she does her debate prep. She's not dealing with somebody who's going to come up and play fair. Attorney General, good to see you as always. Thank you for joining us. The Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison. All right, coming up, Democrats are suing the Georgia Election Board after Trump approved election certification rules passed, the set, passed in the state. The rules in place could be used by county officials who want to refuse to certify the election. The only Democratic member of the Georgia Election Board joins us next. This week, the Democratic Party and 10 Georgia vo voters joined forces in a lawsuit designed to stop the state's election board from in implementing a rule that they say will cause electoral chaos. On July 3rd, the Georgia State Board of Elections unveiled a rule that orders county boards to conduct a, quote, reasonable inquiry, end quote, into certifying the results of an election. It gives every single board member in every county in Georgia the roving power to, quote, examine all election-related documentation created in the conduct of elections, end quote. Shortly thereafter, Donald Trump came to Georgia to egg them on. They're on fire. They're doing a great job. Three members, Janice Johnson, Rick Jeffries, and Janelle King, three people, are all pit bulls fighting for honesty, transparency, and victory. All right, three days later, after Trump said that, those three Republican board members he named passed the rule by a three to two margin. The rule would appear to give any board member the power to sow doubt over or even try to subvert the election results with an open-ended inquiry that could drag out past the certification deadline. But that has never been the job of state and county election boards. And the new lawsuit says, quote, for many decades, the certification of election results was a straightforward administrative process that was faithfully followed by local officials without fanfare or controversy. But in recent years, efforts to delay or impede the certification of election results have become increasingly common. During the 2020 election cycle, these efforts culminated with the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol, end quote. Now, since then, election certification refusers on state and county boards have grown into a persistent problem. Some election boards have had to be forced to do their jobs through emergency litigation. In New Mexico's Otero County, Arizona's Cochise County, and no fewer than three counties in Pennsylvania. And the Atlanta Journal-Constitution reports, quote, at least 19 election board members across nine Georgia counties have objected to certifying elections during the last four years, end quote.
Georgia, after all, is where Rudy Giuliani defamed the mother and daughter poll workers, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, to the point where they received racist death threats. Where Trump infamously demanded that Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, quote, find 11,780 votes, end quote, that he needed to beat Joe Biden in Georgia. Now a judge will decide whether to issue an order making clear that all of the state's election superintendents must certify the election results by November 12th at 5 p.m. That is the usual deadline that is mandated by Georgia state law. Joining us now is Sarah Tyndall uh, Gazelle, a member of the Georgia State Election Board. Sarah, it's good to see you again. Thank you for being with us. And, and you know, you must think I'm a little bit thick because I, I often ask you the same questions because this is a little bit hard to understand uh, about why this has happened um, and, and what the implications are. This has been a normal administrative process that you and other board members are involved in that you're supposed to, you know, as, as, if things go right, you're supposed to, supposed to certify the election. What's changed and why? So, um, well, first, to make it very clear, the state election board does not certify elections. This is for the counties. Right. And then after the counties certify, the secretary of state certifies. Um, it has always been a ministerial process. We have 100 years of precedent saying that the, the role of the boards, of the, of the superintendents, is a scorekeeper. They add up the votes make sure that the, the number of votes is the, is the same as the number of ballots, is the same as the number of voters, and they certify, these are the votes that were cast. Uh, but now, under this new rule, there is certainly, there's uncertainty. Um, rules cannot subvert the statute, they can't break the law, so there's nothing in this rule that could force counties or allow counties under the law to extend the certification past or to refuse to certify. But because of the way the rule is written and because of the commentary around the rulemaking process, it creates an uncertainty around it. So certain board members that already want to and in the past have refused to certify may believe that they've been justified and that, that they're validated in their refusal. Uh, and that's what, um, I, Certainly, I argued against passing this rule because it just creates more uncertainty. Um, uh, unfortunately, I was overruled. So let's just discuss this. The election is November 5th. The, the state um, deadline for certifying the ballots is November 12th. In a normal world, that should make sense. The issue now is that, don't know what problem in theory we're solving for, but a county board or a county board member can say that they've got a reasonable reason to think there's an issue here. and. Conceivably, while the law cannot tell the counties to delay the certification beyond a certain point, it's conceivable that that could then run beyond the certification deadline. Well, certainly what we're what we're concerned about is this is an endless request for more and more documents that have nothing to do with the certification process, because that's what this rule uh, blesses. It says that any individual board member not the not even the superintendent they can just ask for more and more documents and just keep pushing and and questioning and undermining public confidence in the process itself and in the results Sarah, thank you. Uh, drip by drip, we're going to get information on this so that everybody understands the, the implications of this matter. We appreciate you joining us again. Sarah Tyndall Gazelle is a member of the Georgia State Board of Election. All right, coming up in 2018, then-President Donald Trump canceled a trip to a cemetery near Paris where thousands of Marines who died in World War I fighting against Germany are buried. Why did he cancel it? Because Donald Trump said the cemetery was, quote, filled with losers. Now, candidate Trump is besmirching the hallowed grounds of the Arlington National Cemetery. That's next. The very first military burial on the land that would become Arlington National Cemetery occurred on May 13, 1864, when Private William Henry Christman, a 20-year-old soldier fighting for the Union with the 67th Pennsylvania Infantry, was laid to rest. Two days after that, the remains of two unknown soldiers were buried, making them the first of thousands of U.S. military unknowns to be laid in Arlington to rest.
At Arlington, there are two graves of uh, presidents, John F. Kennedy and William Howard Taft, along with secretaries of state, astronauts, admirals, generals, and Medal of Honor recipients. The first African-American to serve on the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall, and civil rights activist Medgar Evers are both buried at Arlington. And with them are Americans from all walks of life who served, many of them dying in combat. Presidents, as you see here, have visited Arlington's peaceful rolling hills to mark solemn occasions like Memorial Day and Veterans Day, to attend funerals and dedicate memorials, and in quiet moments, walking among the graves. One could imagine that Arlington has become a place of reflection for commanders-in-chief who alone bear the responsibility of sending our troops into harm's way. And each president has been careful to keep partisan politics outside of its hallowed gates, except one. This week, Donald Trump visited Arlington not as a former president, but as a presidential candidate, three years after the anniversary of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. The Trump campaign filmed video in Section 60 of Arlington, a heavily restricted area where fallen veterans of the conflicts in Iran and Afghanistan, Afghanistan are buried. An Army spokesperson confirmed to NBC News that the Trump campaign knew that they were not allowed to film there. The participants in the remembrance ceremony had been made aware of federal laws, army regulations, and DOD policies, which clearly prohibit political activities on cemetery grounds, end quote. Federal law, a statement from Arlington National Cemetery, which never names Trump but is clearly about Trump, states, quote, federal law prohibits political campaigns or election-related activities within army national military cemeteries to include photographers, content creators, or any other persons attending for purposes or in direct support of a partisan political candidate's campaign, end quote. Gets worse. Defense officials confirmed to NBC News that an Arlington employee was pushed by a Trump staffer during an incident on Monday. An Army spokesperson confirms that the incident, uh, confirms the incident, saying military police were called, but the Arlington employee decided not to press charges. The New York Times reports that military officials said she, the military officials said the woman feared Mr. Trump's supporting, supporters pursuing retaliation. And if you're wondering, yes, assaulting a federal employee can be prosecuted as a felony. But meanwhile, Trump's campaign told NPR the Arlington employee in question was, quote, suffering from a mental health episode, end quote. Another Trump aide called her despicable. What the hell is the matter with these people? This happened among the graves of American veterans killed in combat. And despite the fact that Trump's campaign called this, quote, a very solemn ceremony, end quote, they've turned their illegal video into campaign content on social media. America's only convicted criminal president broke the law again, this time to steal the valor of the brave Americans who have been buried there for 160 years. Someone in the campaign physically pushed an employee attempting to enforce the law and the Trump team tried to assassinate her character in the national media. She is justifiably afraid of retaliation. This employee had the United States military to come to her defense, but if Trump returns to power, what happens the next time? In a recent attempt to attack the veteran Tim Walls, the Trump campaign threw around the phrase, you'll remember this, stolen valor. Donald Trump avoided military service due to bone spurs. Donald Trump once told Howard Stern that avoiding STDs was, quote, his personal Vietnam. Donald Trump is said to have called those who died in service of this nation suckers and losers. Does the Trump campaign really want to have an argument about stolen valor? Joining us now is Ruth ben a history professor at New York University, author of Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present. Uh, one of the things, Ruth, uh, and welcome back to the show, one of the things that stood out to me was this idea that this federal employee who did have military police present chose not to pursue this matter for fear of retribution and retaliation. And you came to mind when that happened, because you have often pointed out to me that nobody actually has to do anything in, a, in, a, in, a, in an undemocratic society or an authoritarian society. You just have to make people fearful that something will happen to them. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, uh, so many people have been threatened. And he, and in fact, uh, they, what did they do, though? Uh, they're not pressing charges, but the campaign of Trump is doubled down, saying, you know, denigrating her character. So whether you uh, pursue 
you know, charges or you, you hang back, the result is the same. And they're even more empowered to do it to somebody else the next time. I, I, the yeah, I, I, I'd almost say yeah. she didn't press charges. They should be nice to her. Send her a, a basket or something like that. The, the idea that they, they mock her, uh, say she's having a, a mental breakdown, uh, not information that the Trump campaign would have anyway. But this stuff does work for them. It, 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 it seems to resonate with somebody in their base. And all the while, the campaign footage that they weren't supposed to take is being used by them. Well... You know, this employee was very threatening to the campaign because this was somebody who was upholding professionalism uh, and being apolitical. And these are principles that the Trump campaign does not recognize. Indeed, Project 2025 is a plan to take away anybody who is apolitical and professional mm -hmm. uh, and and has honor and ethics uh, out of government completely. L literally, so, uh, they talk about, they actually have literally. a number. They, they talk about 50,000 people that they're prepared to replace in, uh, with people who have sort of got loyalty to Donald Trump, not to the Constitution. Ruth, I want to play something that Donald Trump said tonight in Michigan and just have you evaluate. It's a very short thing that he said about this particular incident and the criticism that he's received. Let's listen. Last night I read that I was using the site to politic that I used it to politic. This all comes out of Washington. And they say I was campaigning. I don't need, the one thing I get is plenty of publicity. I don't need that. I don't need the publicity. So tell me about that for a second. He does get plenty of publicity, that's true. But the I don't need that, I don't need the publicity, I don't believe to be true. He, he, <laughs> he, he only needs that, that's his fuel. It is, and part of this is once again, his character, uh, Donald Trump's you know, M.O. is to degrade uh, and denigrate everybody around him so he can feel more important. And the disgraceful spectacle of smiling and doing a thumbs up in front of a grave, it shows, you know, what, what character he has. And, you know, he does this to everyone. He must humiliate and degrade every occasion. And the more that setting is um, a setting of dignity and honor and uh, principles of selfless service, the more he must wreck it, because that's what authoritarians do. They're, they're nihilists at heart, except for about themselves. They have to you know, pump themselves up and denigrate everyone and everything around them. And we saw that at what happened at Arlington National Cemetery. Yeah, and, you know, on one hand, should anybody be surprised? On the other hand, it's a cemetery of military veterans. I mean, this, this, this knows no limits. Uh, Ruth, thank you, as always. Uh, great to see you. Ruth Ben-Ghiat is a professor of history uh, at, at New York University and the author of Strong Men, From Mussolini to the Present. Okay, coming up, a moment from the Democratic Convention that I'm still thinking about and that captured the hearts of America. The oldest and youngest members of the West Virginia delegation casting their state's votes to nominate Kamala Harris for president. 83-year-old Gene Evans-Moore and 18-year-old Catherine Prather join me next. As a student and as a Georgian, Vice President Harris's promise for our future fills me with hope and joy. As the president of the Savannah State student body, I couldn't be more proud to now announce the next president of the United States of America, Vice President Kamala Harris. That was Savannah State student body president and first-time voter Caitlin Green introducing Vice President Harris earlier tonight. The Harris-Walls campaign is capitalizing on that enthusiasm with the launch of a back-to-school initiative to engage and mobilize student voters. The tour aims to reach 150 campuses and includes doubling staff dedicated to youth and campus engagement across all key battleground states with a focus on state schools, community colleges, and HBCUs like Savannah State. It's also a surge in enthusiasm among black women since Harris launched her presidential campaign. According to the data firm Target Smart, voter registration is up more than 175 percent among young black women since late July. And passing the torch to a new generation was a big theme at the Democratic National Convention last week. And that experience was captured in the very moving roll call of the West Virginia delegation in a moment that went viral. Let's watch. West Virginia, how do you cast your vote? My name is... 
is Jean Evansmore, and I'm 83 years old. And as such, I am the oldest of the delegates in West Virginia. Most 83-year-olds that I know are spending time with their grandchildren or traveling. But I'm here suited up and ready to battle. Because I will not, I repeat, I will not let everything I've fought for be taken away by Donald Trump. My name is Catherine Prather. I am 18 years old, and I am the youngest delegate from West Virginia. I'm suited up and ready for battle because I will not let my freedoms and my future be taken away by Donald Trump. Uh, joining us now, Jean Evansmore, former chairperson for the West Virginia Poor People's Campaign and the oldest West Virginia Democratic delegate and college freshman Catherine Prather, the youngest West Virginia Democratic delegate. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being with us. Um, Ms. Evansmore, it would generally be thought of as impolite to have you on my show and talking about your age, uh, but it's relevant. Uh, you know, and, and it's relevant to this conversation in a way that you've made it relevant to this conversation. And that is when you said, I am not going to let all I've worked for be taken away by Donald Trump. You're talking about a history in which you were in yes. high school in 1956, right after uh, desegregation and, and a, a life as a civil rights activist and a member of the Poor People's Campaign, a continuation of what Martin Luther King was doing when he was mm -hmm. assassinated. So you're talking about a lifetime of work that you are standing up and suited up for battle to protect. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just cannot imagine doing anything else. I felt I was aware, very well aware, that this was history in the making. I, like many people, I was concerned about what was going to happen to me, where I was going to go if Trump got in. I believe that stuff that's been put out. I believe what's in Project 2025. I believe it. He tends to do what he says uh -huh. he's going to do. And I said, no, I, it wasn't going to happen to me somehow or other if I could do anything about it. And that's what you're doing. You do something about it. Catherine, um, you, are, like uh, Jean, are, are also fighting for a lifetime of stuff, but it's your lifetime in front of you, a lifetime of freedom, a lifetime of justice, a lifetime of choice, a lifetime of a better environment, um, a lifetime of being able to afford a home. Uh, tell me what, what drives you. Absolutely. I mean, what really drives me is just the future. I mean, I have my whole life ahead of me. I can't just sit by and let other people make these decisions for me. I need to be involved in the process and make it happen. And how's, it, how's that changed? Because, uh, with, you know, Jean has come from a place where it left her no choice but to be involved that way. And in some ways, Catherine, so are you. You're in a place where if you want these things to change, you're left with no choice but to, to suit up for battle, as you both said. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Catherine, yes. How's, it, how's it feel to, to, to have been standing there next to Gene and understanding that it's, it's, you're both holding the torch together at the moment. You're not passing it just yet. You're holding it together. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, Jean is just an absolutely wonderful person. I look up to her so much. Um, she like runs marathons, like outside of all this political um, stuff. She's just a wonderful person to be around. And I love spending the weekend, the week with her at the convention, just having this incredible experience being surrounded by so many great people. And Jean, tell me the same thing. What, what must you. it feel like Thank to have uh, somebody who maybe in some ways reminds you a little bit of your young self? One of the things that I remember saying a few years ago, um, after see, going to and seeing people that are running for election, and what I was noticing was they just they they should have quit. So I decided 
I'm not voting for anybody that's old. And then, <laughs> well, when this came about, <clears throat> when the voting was going on, I had told people first not to vote for me because I said, I'm not sure that I know anything. But by the time I was, that was the last chance, I, I had changed my mind. I decided I would really like to do this. So that I told them, I said, I've already voted for myself now. I'd appreciate it if you would. So I was flabbergasted to find out that they actually did vote for me. And most of those people that are delegates, I don't know them because we live all over West Virginia, which is a huge area, rural area. And pretty much if you don't live near somebody, or you probably don't know them. But anyway, man, it's, this is... This is this is something everybody should do. Figure out how to make it happen. Start saving your money now. Plan to get to the next one. It's great. I think that's amazing that you're both participating. Uh, Jean, uh, Catherine, one of the things you said is that you want someone in charge who, even if they disagree on how to approach issues, will be empathetic and reasonable. To you, the tone of politics is also something that needs to change. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Um, I would say right now there is way too much inflammatory um, rhetoric from both sides at times. And I re moving forward, I really like want someone who is just a reasonable, respectable person. Mm -hmm. And Harris definitely is that. I mean, I believe, even if I don't agree with everything, but I, I agree with the most part what she's saying. But even if there's some issue that I personally disagree with, I do trust her to... Go, go forward on that issue in a manner that makes sense. Um, and just being a kind person, I think, is really important because having empathy on all these issues and understanding that more than one thing can be true at the same time and just mm -hmm. moving forward in a reasonable manner. I mean, I, I wish that, that I was asking for less than that, but that's really all I'm asking for is just someone who can be an adult in the room. You two are wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, you've made my evening uh, by, by joining me on the show tonight, and I'm really grateful to both of you, not just for being here, but for what you're doing for this country. Gene Evansmore, you got a lot more to do for us, uh, so thank you for keeping this fire born, burning for so long. And Catherine, same thing. You've got a lot more to do uh, for us. Well, I hope we have this discussion again. Thanks to both of you. We'll take a break. Thank we'll you. be right back. All right, this weekend on Velshi, we're highlighting Project 2025's plans to protect and even amplify extremist violence and disinformation campaigns. That'll be this weekend, uh, 10 a.m. to noon, both days. That is uh, the last word for tonight.